Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. My family has owned a 50-acre farm just outside the city limits for over 100 years. It's always been a peaceful place where we've raised cattle and grown crops. That all changed when the new neighborhood of mini mansions was built right next to our property a few years back. These fancy houses came with their very own homeowners association and a board made up of the most entitled busybodies you can imagine. I tried to avoid conflict at first, but they seemed determined to make my life difficult from the start. It began with petty complaints about my cattle making noise or leaving cow patties near the property line fence. Never mind that my farm predates their neighborhood by a century. I told them nicely that cows will be cows and to please not harass my livestock. Things escalated when they started sending me violation notices about the unsightly condition of my barn and equipment sheds. According to their rules, buildings on my property had to be freshly painted and well-maintained. I informed them that while their standards might apply within their subdivision, I was under no obligation to decorate my barns to suit their tastes. After that, they began hassling me about a small footbridge I had built across the creek that ran between our properties. The bridge allowed me to easily access the back pasture where my cattle grazed. Since it was made from rough-hewn lumber and not brick or wrought iron like their little garden bridges, they claimed it was an eyesore. I told them in no uncertain terms that they had zero authority over what I did on my own property. If they didn't like the look of my farm, then they shouldn't have built their subdivision next to it. That's when the new homeowner association president, a woman I'll call Karen, decided to escalate things. One day I came out to find a work crew on my property, demolishing the footbridge with chainsaws. I raced over shouting at them to stop as they were destroying my private property. The foreman just shrugged and said they'd been hired by the homeowner association to remove an unauthorized structure. When I demanded to see permits, he directed me to speak to Karen. She was standing nearby looking smug, arms crossed as she supervised the destruction. I got right in her face and told her she was trespassing and vandalizing my property. She scoffed and claimed the bridge was a hazard that needed to be torn down for safety. I pointed out that the bridge was over a hundred feet from the nearest homeowner association home and thus not in their jurisdiction at all, but Karen arrogantly asserted that anything potentially visible from homeowner association land fell under their purview. Realizing she wouldn't listen to reason, I pulled out my phone to call the sheriff. As soon as I started dialing, Karen signaled her crew and they quickly snatched up their saws and scurried off in their trucks. With the vandals gone, I surveyed the damage. They'd sawn completely through the support beams, leaving the bridge collapsed in the creek bed. I was seething with anger when I went inside to look up the laws. As I knew from the start, the homeowner association had no authority over my private property outside their borders. I immediately called a lawyer who informed me I had an ironclad case to sue for damages. A week later I sent a letter to the homeowner association board demanding they pay $5,000 to replace my bridge or I would file suit. I stated the facts clearly. They illegally trespassed and destroyed my property that was outside their jurisdiction. Karen sent back a nasty letter saying they would not pay one cent since the bridge was an eyesore that had to go. She claimed it impaired the subdivision's premium ambiance and threatened they would remove any future structures they deemed distasteful. Luckily, I had photographic proof and multiple witnesses to the homeowner association's criminal activity. My lawyer easily got a judgment in my favor, which I made sure to rub in Karen's furious face. In the end, the homeowner association had to pay $8,000 to rebuild my bridge and clean up the stream bed. I also took great pleasure in erecting a giant privacy fence around the entire border of my property. Karen learned the hard way that you can't just bulldoze over people's rights and property all in the name of maintaining appearances. The homeowner association now knows they have no power over my land. As for me, I'm just glad I fought back against their harassment and entitlement. Justice was served in the end. The next one is a pro-revenge story. So after my second retirement, I started doing property management. I bought this 2,500 square foot luxury home with the sole intention of renting it out. Now I didn't know how bad the homeowner association was, but when I became the owner, I soon found out. This all took place in two years' time. Karen would literally have a problem with everyone in the neighborhood. Trash cans left out? Fined. Loud music after 10 p.m.? Fined. 
Yard sale without permission? Fine. Removing dead plants and replanting without approval? You get fined. It went on and on like this. Now the community could run for the Homeowner Association Board, but the Homeowner Association Board chose the president. Six out of the ten members on the board liked Karen, so she always kept her job. Her husband was in the medical field, so he made a lot of money. It got to a point, too, where she was called Queen Karen in the neighborhood for dishing out homeowner association fines. Now, I used to go in person to collect the rent because the people that rented my house were good friends of mine. I did this for months. So I would park my car in front of the garage. My friends and I were having some music on, but it wasn't that loud. Queen Karen came over driving her golf cart and said, Queen Karen, excuse me, me, yeah, Queen Karen. You have to turn that music down, it's too loud. I told her that it was 8 p.m. and that music that's even loud can be played until 10. She wasn't having it and demanded that I do so. Now my friends and I kept the music going and we were enjoying ourselves. She proceeded to get angry and find me. Now most people will just take the abuse and pay the fine. But not me. I went to the Homeowner Association Board, contested the fine, and won. From that point on, Queen Karen made it her personal mission to destroy me. She would complain about every little thing. I fought what I could, but I did end up paying for some of it. She also went after my tenants, which made things worse for me. I had a sit-down with my friends one night to discuss the problem. When I parked my car, Queen Karen came over in her robe and said I have to park somewhere else. I did because I didn't want to start anything. We saw her go back into her house and embrace a man that wasn't her husband. We were being noisy, and we came to the conclusion that she was cheating on her husband. Spoiler alert, she was. My friends and I told Queen Karen's husband. I'm sure he did some investigation because three months later they divorced and he was moving his stuff out. Now gossip said that Queen Karen got nothing because she was the one that cheated and she didn't have a job, so she wasn't entitled to the money. From this point on, Queen Karen had a massive decline in the quality of life that she had. She sold her car and got a cheaper one, and she adopted different dressing habits. But even after the divorce, she never got a job, and she was still living somewhat better than everyone else. Fast forward to February 1986, Queen Karen and the Homeowner Association had been giving out fines for very obscure things and increased monthly dues. Having trash cans out a couple of hours early or after the trash man left would result in a fine. Targeting people that had older or dirty cars goes on and on. Me and the other people in the community were sick of the crap that she and the homeowner association were pulling. So at the next meeting, we voiced our concerns. Queen Karen said that the community had been falling behind on repairs, and that the dues and the increase in fines were necessary, especially if people weren't maintaining their property. She said that it was in the yearly budget report and that we should have read it. The other angry residents and I went and read the statement. None of us had read it because we took it as junk mail and disregarded it. But we read the whole statement, cover to cover. Queen had increased the homeowner association budget by 15%, and where that extra money was going remained unknown. We went over to her house the next day and demanded to know where the extra money was being spent, but she refused several times. She closed the door and went back to watching TV. We filed a joint lawsuit to find out where the money was going. In June, we found out. Cue the revenge. Queen Karen was living off homeowner association fines and dues. The increase was because she was running out of money. She still didn't have a job, so she embezzled from the homeowner association so she wouldn't have to get a job. She got busted. We called the police for her embezzling the money. She was charged with fraud and extortion. The neighbors and I filed a joint lawsuit against Karen to get reimbursement as well. Because she had no money, she had to mortgage her house to pay us all. She later went to federal prison for six years with no parole. Because she went away, no one was paying on her house. The bank foreclosed on it, and it was bought by someone else. So when she got out in 1992, she was homeless. Honestly, the majority of us didn't want to ruin her life like this. Had she toned down the excessive fines, we would have let her be, but she had to double down and steal from us because she didn't want to get a job like everyone else. The next one is a petty revenge story. I work at a rather famous home supply and maintenance store. I won't say the name just in case, but to set the scene, a month or so ago, Karen and her husband came in to buy an appliance. 
They happened to come on a very busy day, and we only had two people in appliances, one of whom was going on her lunch. Well, apparently Karen wasn't happy that a couple of men who'd already been waiting were served ahead of her and pitched a tantrum, even going so far as to go up to the girl leaving for her lunch, who was no longer in uniform, was talking to another employee, and berating her for ignoring her. The girl told her multiple times she wasn't on the clock, and Karen informed her it didn't matter. She would help her right then. The girl told her she could wait or take her business elsewhere and went about her business. This apparently pissed off Karen and her husband, as he proceeded to call customer service, I happened to be covering their desk, and began yelling at me that he was a GD man, and that if we were going to serve other men before his wife, we would serve him first. I laughed at him, said that's not how things work, and hung up the phone. We don't take abuse at my store. I definitely refuse to, and the managers generally support us in that. The funny part? Our town has a local Facebook page where you can post reviews and events and Karen decided to make a massive post about what happened, only she actually didn't. She twisted it so that it seemed she'd been purposely ignored. She hadn't. She just didn't want to wait in line. Denied service. She wasn't. She'd confronted and cursed out a teenage employee who was off the clock, and she and her husband had been verbally abused by every employee in the store. They had spoken to the girl and to me, and neither of us abused them. We were both abused. Of course, at first, she got sympathy. From a lot of women of the same mentality, a lot of no-one-wants-to-work-anymore comments. But one of our cashiers happened to be told about it and showed me. I'm petty. I'll admit it beforehand. But I made a fake Facebook account. I don't do social media much beyond lurking on Reddit. And joined the town's page. Needless to say, I first commented in explicit detail everything that actually happened, including direct quotes from the other girl. Then, to sink the duck you Karen knife a little deeper, I copied my post and replied to every comment on her post. This isn't actually what happened. What happened was insert comment here. Within moments, the entire town turned on her. Hundreds of comments calling her a liar and a horrid person. The next morning the post was gone and she's never returned to our store. Was I a bit of a Karen myself? Maybe. But when it comes to my fellow employees, I tend to fight petty fire with petty fire. And thanks to this situation and several more since then, I've become the go-to for dealing with Karens and rude customers when my co-workers can't get a hold of a manager. No way this can end badly, right? The next one is a malicious compliance story. Several years ago, just over a year after high school graduation, I was studying in a transition-to-work program called Nova Employment and had just started my work experience to build my first work resume. I didn't have any particular success in any jobs until I started working in a tow bar factory where I'd impressed my supervisors with how I was cutting and smoothing out the sharp edges of cut tow bars. It was basically me applying the woodworking class skills from high school to a metalworking job, which apparently worked really well, and I was well on my way to getting an official job there. The boss was very patient, professional, and very helpful with teaching me everything I needed to know. I was well on my way to start welding as I expressed interest in it during my breaks. My dad even told me about how my grandfather, who had tragically passed away just five years before, did the same thing for his first job and told me that he was proud of me. But then, about two months later, I got called into the manager's office thinking that I was finally going to be officially hired part-time. However, the opposite happened. I was told that they couldn't afford to officially hire me because they were going to sell and shut down their business. It was the work equivalent of, it's not you, it's me. Once I finished my last day, I was yet again on the Nova employment job hunt. Soon after, I was officially hired for a job. Great, right? Wrong, because while job hunting, the term my old co-workers and I used to describe cutting and smoothing metal as metal polishing, led to a huge misunderstanding with the Nova employment job agency. My official first job was at a fiberglass factory that was located in an old abandoned army base. On my first day, I was handed over to the man who would be my boss. He seemed nice and professional enough, but he had a massive amount of scar tissue on his right arm, seemingly from a shark attack. After the introductions and the obligatory factory workplace tour were out of the way, he handed me a bottle and a rag and told me, Wax polish that fiberglass container. I was extremely confused and understandably felt completely lost about what I was supposed to do. He asked, What's wrong? Do your wax polishing thing. I said, I don't know how. 
He replied, Don't you wax Polish metal? I explained, I cut and smoothed out the sharp edges of metal toe bars with a metal grinder. We just called it metal polishing because it's easier than metal smoothing. My boss then told me to finish my job and brought the Nova employment agent who had taken me there into his office. I then heard them both having a not-so-inconspicuous loud argument coming from his office that echoed throughout the entire factory. That was the first red flag. After that argument, I was sent home since the first day was only spent showing me around, and the boss wanted to see what I could do. But the very next day, everything started getting progressively worse. I began the day with wax polishing, which was fine, but soon after, I was assigned to clean up bins. I overheard him yelling at other employees for not being efficient enough, even though the factory workers were all comprised of workers with varying disabilities, myself included. This was the second red flag. The next day I was told to sort tools, and I couldn't make heads or tails of what to do. I asked him if he could teach me and make sure I was on the same page, but instead he got angry, ranting, Why the heck did I bother hiring you if I have to do your job for you? He then sent me to rake the dirt duty on the side of the factory building, which he specifically pointed out was filled with snakes, and handed me the rake. This was the third red flag. The following morning, instead of clocking in for my shift, I walked away to the nearest bus stop and had a glorious idea. He wanted a job done, fine, but I'll do it my way. I headed back to work, clocked in to start my shift, and oddly enough, he didn't seem to notice that I was late as he was preoccupied yelling at other employees. So I started sweeping, and then he called me over to clean the entire bathroom. I asked him, where's the mop and bucket? He replied, there is no mop and bucket. Use the fire hose and grab a rag. He showed me where the fire hose was and let me have at it while he moved on to yell at the next employee. I tried to ask someone for help, but nobody was answering, so I put my hands together and got to work. I set up the hose to point outside the bathroom window so it wouldn't spray everywhere. But as I turned on the fire hose, it not only sprayed everywhere, but it soaked everything in the bathroom, including the toilets, floors, walls, roof, and even the toilet paper wasn't spared. I was afraid to walk in there at first since from the outside it sounded like the bathroom was haunted. But I did go in, and I saw the fire hose flying around, spraying everything in sight with gallons upon gallons of water. I frantically tried to salvage the situation, but it just kept getting exponentially worse. So I gave up, turned off the hose, and reeled it back into the wall mount. As I finished my job, I saw that the bathroom was now in such a state that it would even make Lano and Amp Woodley proud. I then had my lunch and proceeded like nothing had happened, then finished my shift for the day. The following Monday, Christmas came early as I was notified by Nova Employment that I was fired, and immediately shouted, Oh my sweet Jesus, there is a God! I could only imagine what kind of look that boss had on his face, but it was well worth the constant verbal abuse that he gave me and my fellow co-workers. The next one is an entitled people story. So I, trans M16, recently noticed that I was receiving fewer calls from my dad. I didn't think anything of it. I was happy that I finally got a break from him. For context, the reason I was happy is that my dad isn't a good person. My dad was my first bully. He's the one who gave me insecurities when I was too young to understand why he hated that I was chubby. He picked on my afro, even though he also has an afro. Soon after, I was beaten for the smallest things, if I had a C on a test or my bedroom was messy. I got beaten until I was black and blue and bleeding. I still have the marks on my back from his beatings. I took it all thinking one day he'd change until this year. I posted about the incident on here, but after a big fight with my mom, about the abuse I went through as a kid and my mental health, etc. He called me saying how he hated me, he wished I wasn't born, and he was going to beat me up and treat me like a real man. The cops wouldn't help us when he threatened me, so we had to hide because I knew he wasn't lying and I wouldn't fight my dad. After that, and him apologizing to me, he said he was sorry I felt like he did wrong and that he was stressed, I decided to keep all contact to a minimum. It was difficult, but I finally did it. So when he stopped texting and calling me daily, I thought maybe he finally got the memo. Nope. My mom found out this week that he went to his family and his new girlfriend saying that I cut him off because of my mother and that I was doing this to get money out of him. He couldn't believe he raised an a-hole and more. I was surprised because he doesn't have money. He hasn't helped out with me and my younger siblings that he made in months. 
We need shoes, socks, glasses, meds, and clothing because we're growing, and yet not a single penny. He basically accused his own son of being a gold digger, but there's no gold to be found. Call me Christopher Columbus because he also said, I drained all his money and made him move out of my life. He doesn't have money to be drained? And I didn't make him leave my life. I tried so hard to make him happy. I did basketball and we were undefeated. I hate basketball, yet it was never enough. After the last time he threatened me, I didn't want him to have another chance. Now his family, his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's kids hate me for being an a-hole. They helped him, apparently decided to do the same, so he blocked me on everything, basically cutting me off, too. I'm just so bewildered and surprised at how delusional you have to be to say you were a good dad when you act like a toddler. It's like, why even bother? You're broke, you abuse your kids, you don't even own a house. Why would I want to gold dig that? Like people of the court, my dad is a six of five inches body-built black man who goes around saying, black females are so sensitive, but when faced with the crap he put me through, he decides to act all big and bad and try to silence me. Sir, please, you and your homies, walk around with your pants sagging like you're trying to see whose ass is fatter. I don't want to hear how I'm gold digging my own dad when he can't afford McDonald's. I just needed to vent about this because it's just so surprising, honestly. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.